Hello everybody, I'm Professor Chloe Orkin and I'd like to welcome you, a very warm welcome to this program on re-emerging infectious diseases. The, op the program overview for today includes updates on MPOX, Ebola, and on the concurrent resurgen, resurgence of RSV and other respiratory viruses in 2022. This will be followed by a live Q&A and then we'll close the program. So our objectives for today are to outline our current knowledge of the epidemiology of the recent viral outbreaks, to categorize the various clinical symptoms for case recognition, definition, and to reflect on the therapeutical options, therapeutic options for treatment and prevention. So in terms of using the platform, what we'd like you to do please is to submit your questions through the live Q&A widget, which you can see on the right, and chat and connect with your colleagues through the meeting hub and if you need any technical support please use the live support icon uh, and we'll be very pleased uh, to assist you we'd like to acknowledge our endorsers who are IAPAC the International Association of Providers of AIDS Care and NATAP the National AIDS Treatment Advocacy Project uh, and also to acknowledge the program directors, uh, Professor Jonathan Shapiro and Professor Dan Karitskis, uh, who hopefully will be joining us uh, for the Q&A. We very much value your feedback and we ask you to please participate in the post-meeting survey after the event. And we'll provide you with a certificate of attendance, which will be sent by email on completion of the post-workshop survey. So the first talk um, will be uh, by me. So I'll give myself a short introduction. Uh, I am from Queen Mary University of London and I'm professor of HIV medicine. And I also work on COVID, MPOX and viral hepatitis. And I'll be speaking today on MPOX. I hope you enjoy my talk. I'm gonna be speaking about MPOX, which is uh, the renamed word for what used to be known as monkeypox. It's now been reclassified to make it uh, non-offensive to certain populations. I have no disclosures related to monkeypox. So what causes it? It's a double-stranded DNA virus, and it's in the orthopox viridae family, including vaccinia, cowpox, and variola. And all of these viruses are genetically similar, and hence they induce cross-immunity. So for the first 40 years of monkeypox, it was first diagnosed in laboratory monkeys in Denmark and infected a, a human baby in 1970 in uh, what is now the DRC, and then uh, caused limited endemic uh, outbreaks related to animal, animal reservoir in, in Western and Central Africa. But you can see that the cases were really increasing quite a lot and occasionally uh, there would be an exported case in other countries and there you can see how things have really really increased uh, in in recent years so this should have been a warning to us and actually the global outbreaks should not have been a big surprise and what we have seen this year which has been really quite striking is the near simultaneous outbreaks uh, in more than 110 different countries so currently we have around 85,000 infections based on January 23 data. We have 60 deaths uh, during the global outbreak in countries uh, that have not historically had monkeypox. Um, and the new cases globally are decreasing, but in the Americas, particularly in Latin America, it is still raging in, in particular in, in, in certain countries. And there's a real issue of equity around vaccine and treatment access, really, really a very serious issue. Uh, now, interestingly, our colleagues in Nigeria had been warning us uh, that monkeypox might be behaving differently. They'd been reporting this. Uh, They've been reporting transmission through genital secretion suspected. That's in 2017. They've been reporting on a sexual history of human monkeypox patients. Uh, and they'd also been uh, describing uh, linked heterosexual transmissions. So I think it's really important 
uh, that we realized that uh, the signs were there, just nobody was listening. Um, and in terms of nomenclature, what's been realized is that the cause of this outbreak is a particular type of monkeypox, and it's related to what used to be the virus that was in West Africa, particularly to the strain that caused the 2017-18 outbreak in Nigeria. However, um, there is a new proposed uh, reclassification of monkeypox uh, in which the current strain causing the outbreak is being named as clade 3 um, which is a new virus originally originating from West Africa. And please note that we're no longer calling monkeypox after the, the countries or regions where they come from. We're naming them one, two, and three in order not to stigmatize. And this picture is from a very excellent editorial uh, in the NEJM. Um, what has been found is that the virus has been, has been uh, mutating at a, at a, and evolving at a rate higher than expected for a stable DNA virus. You would have expected about four mutations a year. Instead, there are 50. And this suggests that adaptive evolution may be accounting for the global outbreak. And in fact, uh, many human-to-human -human chains have been uh, established with some phylogenetic differences, suggesting that what, what the Nigerian colleagues uh, suspected has in fact been the case. Now, these international case definitions uh, evolved very quickly in May 2022 in response to what was happening, and they realized very quickly uh, that they needed to specify that the disease was occurring in sexually active gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. And they noticed some early associations with multiple partners, sex on site venues, sexual contact, uh, HIV, close contact, large gatherings, pride events and international travel. And these were uh, reported in multiple case series. Now, interestingly, the proportion who are men who have sex with men has gone down as time has gone on uh, with other people being infected, particularly in, in, in Latin America. And, and this led us and our group to... Uh, uh, develop a case series, a global case series in women and non-binary individuals. Uh, and uh, the epidemiology uh, was predominantly sexual contact for cis women, for trans women, and for non-binary individuals. 25% um, of cis women had acquired monkeypox via a non-sexual route. And interestingly, in the cis women uh, in whom there were children in the homes of around 25% of people, only two got monkeypox, so that's an interesting uh, finding. In terms of testing, how do you test for it? Well, PCR is the gold standard from a lesion. Swabbing of two lesions is recommended. It's important also to test for other sexually transmitted infections and very importantly for HIV. And serology will identify exposure to all orthopoxviridae. People who've been vaccinated against smallpox so may test positive uh, on, on, on an antibody. Now, what about transmission? So what we found in our large global case series was that in 32 semen samples that were tested, there was a uh, monkeypox virus was found in 29 of them. And uh, in terms of anal and urethral swabs, variable virus has been isolated from these sites. Uh, and in our case series on uh, women and non-binary individuals, we also find it in, in 14 out of 14 vaginal swabs. And this strengthens the argument around uh, not only sexual contact, but potentially sexual transmission, but this still needs to be confirmed. So this raises the question, is MPOX an STI? Is it a conventional sexually transmitted infection? Well, I did an, uh, an ED ECDC uh, webinar debate against the very um, amazing Professor Alexandra Kami. We debated the issue. Um, and I guess it really depends on who you ask, but my view is yes, although in the debate, I had to argue no. <laughs> so um, what uh, I think what the, the naysayers would say that human semen can host up to 27 different viruses. So the fact that it's found in semen doesn't mean it's actually causing infection. However, as we all know, the Swiss statement in HIV was groundbreaking and very uh, premonitory. And they have said, the same group have said that it must for now be considered to be an STI and should be treated as such. But it's important to note that it can and has been transmitted out of sex, outside of sex, as we have seen in uh, it's sort of the endemic areas where it's been transmitted for a long time uh, via animal reservoir and from person to person touch, which has been non-sexual. So how has it been presenting clinically in the global outbreaks? 
So there have been multiple uh, case series describing it, including our large case series uh, in the NEJM. Um, and these case series described something that was different from what had been described in the original case definitions at the beginning of May 2022, where uh, the definitions were derived from historical literature. And what you can see is really what was described as an unexplained acute rash with a fever, lymphadenopathy, and various other systemic symptoms. However, there are gaps because genital and mucosal lesions were not specified or mentioned in these definitions. And what we found is that in, in fact, 95% uh, of people were presenting with a rash, which was predominantly genital or anal, and it was much fewer lesions that had been previously described. Um, and 10% presented with a single genital lesion. And the rashes occurred in multiple phases of evolution, with most of it being described as vesicular pustular. But 41% had mucosal lesions, and there were mucosal first presentations. So in the anorectal mucosa in 12%, oropharyngeal in five and conjunctival in 0.5 and urethritis as a presentation was described in other reports. So this is what it looks like and you can see it can vary from very mild on the left that could be a little bit of molluscum or anything else to really quite severe disease uh, on the top right panel. Um, you can see that it is affecting the anal mucosa very clearly as well as, the, as, as well as the anal verge. And on the right, you see a very tiny little uh, skin lesion showing how mild and inconsequential the disease can be and how easily missed. You can see that perioral lesions occur both on the skin, on the tongue, and very commonly, in fact, uh, in the tonsils. And there's a fantastic paper, paper from uh, Oriol Mitya's group showing um, that the type of sex is related to where you would find the lesions. So we also uh, pr presented data, as I've said, on, on women and non-binary people, and we found that mucosal lesions were very common. And we found similarly that the lesion site concurred with the type of sex. People were frequently misdiagnosed uh, and women with non-sexual transmission were less likely to have genital lesions. Which sort of leads me to the point of asymptomatic carriage. As I showed you, there are some very porcy symptomatic or asymptomatic disease. And these are studies where what they've done is they've done asymptomatic swabbing of the rectal mucosa in people presenting either with nothing or with other sexually transmitted diseases besides monkeypox. And what they have found is they've actually found the virus in people with no symptoms. So this is an important understanding in terms of how the disease has spread so rapidly uh, amongst uh, sexually active gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. So what about complications? Well, complications do occur by far and away. The most common complications are related to infection, secondary infection. So you can get abscesses, cellulitis, um, and sometimes these can be severe and require drainage. You can get very severe anorectal pain, ulcers, and you can also get perforations, bowel perforations, and many people have needed to be admitted to manage pain, rectal pain. Um, you can also get urinary retention and parathymosis and very severe oral and tonsillar disease, which can stop you from swallowing and lead to hydration. And in a couple of cases, even uh, AKI. Um, ocular disease happens. Keratitis is something that happens. We reported on two cases of myocarditis. And there's an interesting uh, systematic review done by Badenoch et al., which looked at the presence of seizures uh, and CNS disease, such as confusion, headache, and depression, and found these to be occurring in around 2% based on historical series. There's also a picture of sort of morbidiform rash, which has been described consistently, and which we found as well in our NEJM case series. So what about hospitalization? Well, in Europe, 6.4% of people were hospitalized with 0.1% in ICU, and nobody died in this case, in this group that were analyzed. Prevalence of MPOX in people with HIV is high, regardless of where you look. In the global case series, 41% were people living with HIV. In the WHO data set, 46.5%. The US data set, 38%. The question is why? 
Is this behavioral? Are people serious sorting? Is this that people with HIV are more well linked in with services and are more likely to be diagnosed with milder disease? Is it biological? Is it got to do with the microbiome? We don't really know. What we do know is that prior to 2022, there were worse outcomes in people in Nigeria who weren't suppressed and were with advanced disease. However, in our large case series and several others with good CD4 counts, there were no differences in outcome between people living with HIV and without HIV. The CDC data set in a group of people who were experiencing uh, disparities based on uh, the effects of intergenerational racism, uh, racially minoritized people who were not all virally suppressed, showed some clinical differences with more hospitalizations and more rectal disease. However, only a small proportion of these people had very low CD4 counts. So there's still a big get data gap here in terms of really understanding uh, what's going on. The CDC have said that where they've been consulted about people with severe manifestations, the majority are people living with HIV with CD4 counts less than 200. And these people should be prioritized for Tecovirumet and Vaccinia IG. So what are the treatment options? The treatment options are supportive care because it's a self-limiting disease in most people uh, and also antivirals. So the antivirals predominantly I, I'm going to talk about is tecovirumab, uh, which inhibits the viral envelope protein 37 to prevent the virus from leaving infected cells. And there's been a C CDC MMWR case series uh, last year on 549 people uh, receiving tecovirumab. And what they found, um, this was after about seven days of symptoms, what they found is that the median time from initiation to improvement was three days and that the, the differences, it was similar in people with or without HIV. And obviously they weren't able to say based on this data set whether it was effective. They were able to say that there were no significant outcomes that they considered it to be safe. Obviously it needs to be further studied. And they suggest the indications are for lesions in sensitive or high risk sites. Um, such as the eye, pharyngeal or rectal pain would be important, a very high number of lesions, rapid progression, and immunocompromising conditions. Now with vaccination, there's a high degree of similarity between different orthopox viruses with lots of shared immune epitopes. And that means that you can use vaccines that have been developed for smallpox, um, such as the Genius Invenex MVA Bavarian Nordic and the AKM2000. You can use it post-exposure, ideally within four days to, to limit the disease, but you can also use it as expanded pre-exposure prophylaxis for those at high risk, so populations at risk. Now, when you do this, the recommended vaccine is Imvenex or Gineos. It's a replication deficient modified vaccinia ankara, um, and you can give it intradermally um, which means you can use 0.1 mils intradermally, but for people living with HIV, who haven't been vaccinated with low CD4 counts, you shouldn't use the intradermal route. And it should be should have a second dose, and you shouldn't use the ACAM vaccine in people living with HIV. Now, how effective is it? So a UK uh, public health agency preprint has shown that the estimated vaccine effectiveness more than 14 days after a single dose was 78%. But within the first 13 days, it's around 4%. So it's not actually very effective until uh, you, you've had a time to develop some sort of immune response. So people who are vaccinated should be aware they're not protected uh, for two weeks. So what are we gonna do? How are we ever gonna progress and, and eliminate monkeypox? What do we need to do? Well, I urge you to read this fantastic editorial uh, led by uh, the wonderful Bahuma Titanji. Uh, and her editorial really focuses on vaccine access and equity, and this is a key step because unless we're all safe, nobody is safe. We need to better understand the reservoir. We need to understand the role of presymptomatic and asymptomatic transmission. We need to be on top of better diagnostics, equity and access to good therapeutics, surveillance. We need to know what's happening in different countries. All of this requires funding, and it also requires uh, dealing with the stigma of a disease which is now associated with sexual transmission. 
And finally, I would like to end by honoring and appreciating the magnificent activists and activism that's happened all over the world. And in the UK, uh, there's been some really fantastic examples of uh, this person is uh, Harun Tulane, who chronicled his journey with monkeypox on Twitter in order to help other people to understand what to look out for and to warn them of, of the dangers of mpox. Uh, and you can see that uh, the other picture is of somebody who's delivered a mpox pop-up vaccination clinic at Black Pride. So I think we all need to ask ourselves as we go forward, how can we help and support the activism uh, and support the effort uh, to uh, improve uh, eradication or minimization of uh, the effects of mpox uh, on the on the uh, sexually active gay and bisexual uh, men who have sex with men community and in other countries uh, with little access or no access to vaccines or treatments. Thank you for your attention. Hi again. Um, I would like to uh, warmly uh, introduce uh, Dr. Eugene Richardson, who will be speaking about uh, Ebola. Uh, he is an infectious disease expert um, who works, amongst other things, with the WHO, the African CDC, uh, and his particular interest is on reparations and redistributive justice. He co-chairs the Global Environmental Change Commission on Climate Reparations. Unfortunately, uh, Eugene is unwell today and is not with us. Um, so let, let's hear his lecture now. Greetings. Thank you for joining us today. I'll be presenting an Ebola update. And... Um, if any of you want to interact in the Twitter sphere, here is my handle, uh, unsymbolize. First, just like to uh, say a few words about uh, my dear friend and mentor, Paul Farmer, who was the chair of our Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, and we lost last year. He was a well-known physician, medical anthropologist, and humanitarian, and um, led our efforts in the West Africa Ebola outbreak um, via his uh, being chief, chief strategist of Partners in Health, raising lots of money um, and, and setting up facilities, prioritizing treatment for people suffering from Ebola, and he is dearly missed. As far as disclosures, I have no financial relationships with commercial entities to disclose, and let's get right into it. Uh, Ebola virus, which is the genus, uh, is in the family of filoviruses. It is an enveloped, non-segmented, negative sense, single-stranded RNA virus with seven genes. And there are now six species, uh, four of which cause disease in humans. Here's an electron micrograph. Pathogenesis, there's uh, cell entry and tissue damage, gastrointestinal uh, dysfunction, systemic inflammatory response, coagulation defects, and impairment of adaptive immunity. And as you know, um, the worst manifestation is a hemorrhagic shock. Um, untreated, many of the species can have up to 70% um, mortality rates, but uh, as we'll see, that's a total social construction because with a good ICU that you may find in ICU uh, in Europe or in the United States and other areas, um, you can get the uh, mortality rate to as down uh, to as low as five percent. So I'd like to start by describing my experience in Sierra Leone so you can see how far the science has come over the past uh, seven years, eight years. We started in Sierra Leone in 2014, where I was the clinical lead for Ebola, uh, Partners in Health's Ebola response. And containment looked like this. You, uh, people would call this number 117. Information would go through these uh, uh, people manning the phones, and send. they'd send out the information to these district Ebola response centers. I was working at the Dirk in Kono District, which is uh, pretty famous for having lots of diamond mines, lots of riches under the ground, but nothing in the way of health facilities, uh, roads, educational infrastructure to show for it. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, the case definition back then was either uh, contact with the suspected probable or known case and fever, or contact in any of these three symptoms or unexplained bleeding or miscarriage. 
So it was really difficult early on in 2014 to distinguish malaria, typhoid, or even somebody uh, having a, an abortion uh, or miscarriage uh, from uh, an Ebola case. And a lot of times these people were put together and, and sent off to isolation for, for testing, which could take up to seven to 10 days to get the results back. So there was a lot of nosocomial transmission early in this outbreak. Uh, and I'll show you why that's changed over the years. So we would send out uh, an ambulance to gather the patient and take them for testing, uh, isolation testing and treatment. But there wasn't always treatment available. So I first started out out at a uh, Doctors Without Borders mission in Kailaun, where they weren't allowing us to put in IVs for people in shock. Uh, they thought it was too dangerous for the healthcare staff. Um, and so, you know, that a place like that had higher mortality than places that were putting it actually, you know, giving IV treatment. I soon moved to Partners in Health, where Paul Farmer was prior prioritizing ag aggressive treatment for uh, all patients. Uh, safe and dignified burials are a very important part of the response, um, as Ebola corpses can be very contagious. This was run by the Red Cross and Red Crescent, and they did a very good job. I don't think they had any staff infections after even after 7,000 plus burials. Here we are going house to house, uh, doing community sensitization and active surveillance. And uh, we had partnered with the uh, Sierra Leone military to do this. Here is what uh, a large Ebola treatment unit looks like, but um, we started moving away from these because they took around two or three months to build. And by that time, the outbreak had moved to a, another district. So instead, we started this decentralized response where we were building these small 12-bed units um, that we could put up in about a week and train everybody in a week uh, and get them rolling and allow people to get care closer to home and allowed a platform for uh, community sensitization. Here's what they looked like almost complete. They were supported by uh, UNICEF. Here you see that our office is up front. This was the red zone back here. Patients would come in a dry tent, a wet tent, wet tent being for people with symptoms of diarrhea and vomiting, and then uh, showers, latrines, and a morgue back here. Here was our case management uh, protocol back then. So we'd give vitamin K for any uh, bleeding <laughs> uh, or hemorrhagic manifestations, empiric malaria treatment, ceftriaxone and metronidazole for, there was this presumption of gut translocation uh, causing extra sepsis. Uh, so people were treated with that, ringer's lactate. And then when people could take orals, we had uh, oral versions of all, all those medications. Now let's fast forward from the 2014, 15, um, 16 West Africa outbreak to 2019 in DRC. How had the science progressed? So we had a vaccine. Uh, here I am receiving the Merck vaccine, which is a single dose for the Zaire species. Very effective over 90%, uh, but some pretty strong side effects. Uh, I felt like I had malaria for a couple of days after that, but I also felt much safer in the red zones. Here's the construct, so the uh, vesicular stomatitis virus. Uh, they would clip out the glycoprotein gene, transfer it to the VSV so that it would express the, the GP protein. And then it was a weakened version of this, I think it's a cattle virus that was then injected into people, um, still making them sick. There was another construct uh, from Janssen, a, a prime boost, uh, which was derived from an adenovirus uh, expressing a um, a variant of the Zaire species. But then there was a se second component, um, a filo vector, which had the Zaire, Sudan, and Marburg, and Thai uh, forest nucleoprotein inserts. So I guess I felt a bit uh, optimistic that this one was out there because the new outbreak that uh, started last year in Uganda was the Sudan species. But the problem with this uh, uh, virus here is that the second component gets injected eight weeks later. And so it's not really helpful in the acute outbreak setting. So as we'll uh, talk about, they had to come up with some uh, some new vaccines to test, which unfortunately, uh, and fortunately, I guess you could, say, uh, you could say, we didn't get to test, but the outbreak ended quickly enough so that there's no longer circulation. 
One big improvement in the DRC outbreak was diagnostics. So um, Cepheid had come up with a gene expert cartridge for Ebola, and this allowed us right at the isolation unit and treatment unit to test and get results within two hours, uh, greatly diminishing the problem of nosocomial transmission that we had in that West Af Africa outbreak. Here we are with WHO doing a, uh, a vaccination campaign, but you know, in this village of over 200 people, I think we only had eight or 10 people vaccinated. And so although we have some great tools now, including vaccines and monoclonals, one of the problems is um, uptake. Um, and a lot of people are chalking this up to misinformation and whatnot. I'll show you a quick copy of the book I wrote where I trace it back to uh, colonial and neo-colonial legacies. Hair did improve uh, in the DRC outbreak. So here I am at Alima, where they had these Ebola cubes, which made it safer uh, for the healthcare practitioners, but allowed us to do a lot more as far as uh, monitoring uh, labs and then admission uh, um, of the monoclonal treatments. Here are the therapeutics that be that were available in the DRC outbreak. So we had the ZMAP and Remdesivir that were there earlier, but Regeneron had come up with a cocktail, and then we had another single monoclonal antibody cocktail. And the trial for these was stopped early, showing that the cocktails, um, especially when given early, and that was part of the problem because people were showing up very sick, but when getting these early, also over 90% uh, cure rate. So we have a over 90% vaccine, uh, at least for Zaire strain, and over 90% monoclonal. Um, so the, that science part has, has um, been solved, but you know, getting these uh, products into people's bodies it, it is another story. Here we go and fast forward again to the Uganda outbreak, which started last year in September. Um, and the difference here was that it was the Sudan species. Um, there were 142 confirmed cases um, and at least reported and 87 recovered. So that was a case fatality rate of 39%, but there were also 22 deaths among probable cases, raising this overall CFR to 47%. And uh, this is most certainly an undercount, uh, as my group has published, uh, at least from the West Africa outbreak, when we did zero surveys afterwards. There's a fair amount of up to you know 20 to 25% asymptomatic uh, Ebola infection, and then a lot of missed cases as well. So these are certainly under reports, uh, which, you know, after post zero surveys will show. This is what was reported. Um, teams did a great job of, uh, you know, following uh, 4,000 contacts for the incubation period of 21 days. And then after two incubation periods of 42 days, uh, the, this outbreak was declared ended on January 11th. Here's what the case counts looked like, at least reported cases. This is a week in the year, um, all the way towards the end of the year. And then we have the 42 uh, day period with no cases and it was declared ended. Here's a de geographical distribution. So here's one of the things with uh, uh, Ebola that also makes it uh, difficult to contain that with a average of six to 10 day uh, incubation period, it gives people time to travel once they're exposed. So we actually had, um, you know, cases in uh, uh, districts that weren't next to each other. But uh, Uganda Ministry, along with uh, NGOs and WHO did a great job of, of containing it in a three month period. There were three vaccines that were uh, approved by the Ugandan government for field testing. Uh, two of them had an adenovirus construct, and then another one was based on that Merck uh, vesicular stomatitis virus, which we had discussed earlier, which had then been licensed over to the uh, International AIDS Vaccine Institute. All of them were single doses, making them appropriate for an acute um, uh, outbreak. Some were already available. <laughs> they realized a month late that, uh, that they had about 100,000 in, in the freezers. The problem with those is that frozen bulk vaccine um, can take 60 to 90 days to get out into vials. So it's also not quite ideal to be stored in that, um, in that fashion for uh, future outbreaks. So it raises the issue, and this is the big uh, scientific and containment issue for future outbreaks. Um, how do we get shots ready for, for vaccines that aren't approved? Um, 
for future vaccine, uh, for future outbreaks, whether it's a Sudan uh, species or, uh, or, or other species of Ebola. And we have Mike Ryan here um, in an interview with Stat saying, if we wanna be truly strategic, what we should be doing is having ready to go trial platforms in a set of countries with products ready to go. That requires a huge effort on everyone's part and an effort that doesn't result in immediate results. It actually it costs a lot of money too because you could have these vaccines waiting for outbreaks that never happen and when they expire, they have to renew. Um, so he continues, you could develop these products, have them in clinical lots, and you could develop the trials platforms, but never use them. But other than going in and vaccinating large populations now with uh, you know, uh, vaccines that we already have approved, say, for in areas where Zaire circulates, um, in order to get this testing done, uh, since we're getting better at containment, we're going to need stocks uh, and stocks that aren't just frozen and in bulk, ready to go uh, to run these trials. So that's the big issue, virologically speaking, um, going uh, and anticipating future outbreaks. And I said I'd mentioned earlier that, you know, to me, one of the big issues is is not just having these tools ready, not getting, you know, not having the lab work and the, the science done in anticipation of outbreaks, but it's actually acceptance of uh, on the ground of these products, uh, whether they be monoclonals for treatment or vaccines for, uh, you know, uh, uh, free exposure. And so I wrote a book based on my experience in, in the uh, West Africa Ebola outbreak, talking about the colonial and neo-colonial determinants that we really need to focus on uh, so that this trust uh, um, of foreign groups coming in uh, uh, is built. And so any of you that are interested in that side of things, I, I uh, recommend my book, who, uh, which with a forward by our friend, Paul Farmer. And with that, I'll say thank you uh, for listening to the Ebola update. Here's my email uh, and if there are any further discussion. Uh, but again, I thank you for your attention and uh, Godspeed. Well, I hope you enjoyed that wonderful talk um, from our previous speaker. And I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Roberta de Biasi, who is the Chief of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at the Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC, and is a tenured professor of pediatrics and microbiology, immunology, and tropical medicine at George Washington University School of Medicine, and principal investigator in the Center for Translational Research within Children's Research Institute. And she'll be talking about a resurgence of RSV and other respiratory viruses uh, during uh, 2022. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to present today on the concurrent resurgence of RSV and other respiratory viruses that we all have experienced over December and January of this last winter. These are my disclosures. I have several sources of COVID and respiratory virus research funding. Uh, these include funding from the NIH and NIID, as well as NICHD, and from the DC Department of Health, as well as a Pfizer vaccine trial. None of these are relevant to the uh, lecture at hand with regard to conflict of interest. So I think we all have been very focused on COVID circulation in the United States over the last three years. And here I'm showing a very nice COVID tracker that New York Times puts out each and every day, um, showing the entire trajectory of the uh, pandemic. And as, as we all have experienced, we've had several different waves, the most remarkable of which was in January of last year in 2022, when the Omicron uh, variant surged. And thankfully, since that time, we've had this lower level of circulation of COVID with some slight increases even uh, recently, but nowhere near that massive surge when the first type of Omicron variant surged. What also we all experienced was during this entire time over the last three years, there was really no co-circulation of other respiratory viruses, and particularly not in the pattern that we're used to seeing, um, meaning those that we know come in the fall, those that come in the spring. And in fact, it was so marked that at the beginning of the pandemic, 
many of us scratched our heads and wondered if there was actually a biologic basis for this, meaning interference of receptors or some reason uh, why a patient infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus could not, perhaps not be co-infected with another virus. And now what we've seen as we have loosened up all of our uh, social distancing, our really ex um, marked use of masks in all settings, is that there has been an explosion of re-emergence of these respiratory viruses. So that really has uh, answered our question about, is it really uh, possible to be co-infected with multiple viruses? And we know from this winter that the answer to that is a resounding yes. So this was a CDC health alert that came out in November of 2022, when it was already appreciated that there was really a marked increase in multiple viruses and co-circulation of particularly respiratory syncytial virus, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and the beginnings of circulation of influenza virus. Um, and this was really in marked distinction to everything we had seen in the earlier parts of the pandemic. So um, this is slides showing uh, the influenza activity uh, in the United States, comparing this season, which is 2022 and 23 in the red triangles with other prior five prior seasons. And what you can see in this slide is that the U.S. influenza activity was higher and earlier than in all of these prior five seasons. So here we are in weeks 40 through 50 of the year with this large spike of influenza, which is eclipsing any of these prior years and, of course, many weeks prior to what we usually see. Additionally, it wasn't just the amount of virus, it was the severity. So U.S. influenza hospitalizations were higher and again occurring earlier because of the circulation of the virus than in those other five seasons. So red again is this 2022-23 season compared to all these other prior seasons. What about respiratory syncytial virus? Again, uh, infections and hospitalizations markedly higher than in the prior five seasons. So if, even if we look at this for pediatrics, which is in the blue, or uh, the youngest kids that are zero to four years of age that are highest risk of hospitalization, um, we see that this huge spike of hospitalizations in these younger kids vastly surpasses that what we saw in the earlier seasons in 2019, 20, and 21, and even 2022. So what are the possible reasons for this large surge in co-circulation of these other respiratory viruses that suddenly came out of, the, out of the woodwork in December of 2022? One thought is that the lack of circulation in 2020 and this very small, oddly timed, small peak of RSV in the summer viruses really correlated with when we decided we were going to ease measures to prevent SARS, the measures that we knew a decreased SARS-CoV-2 transmission. We had vastly less social distancing and less masking. People were going back to school, back to normal conferences, in-person meetings. And with that, we really saw the, the fact that these measures not only were preventing SARS-CoV-2 circulation, but all these other viruses. And then that was made even more um, marked because of the so-called immunity gap. So because in the last two years, there really has been no opportunity for young children in particular to have any exposure or develop any immunity to these viruses. When they now had emerged, it was causing a large number of infections in children under uh, four years of age, and particularly those under two years of age. And in fact, even the older children who had in previous years had some exposures had waning levels of immunity that had not had an opportunity for natural boosting because there was no circulation of these viruses in the environment. And in fact, even older children and family members who were more likely to get infected could then pass this on to these immuno-naive uh, children. So I'm now going to share a little bit of data from our own personal uh, viral surveillance at Children's National, where we do this week in and week out. We've done it for decades. And I'm going to orient you first. So what you'll see here over a period of the entire term of the pandemic is that the green bars represent uh, SARS-CoV-2 circulation. So you see again, this large spike, just to orient you in time, that was the Omicron emergence um, in um, and earlier uh, parts of the year. And then in the other colors, uh, we have orange influenza A, and we have blue rhinovirus enterovirus and purple RSV. And what you'll notice here is there was essentially not much of anything but COVID circulating 
until this latest surge uh, over on the right, where we now had a huge uh, number of orange bars of influenza virus and a much larger proportion of the bars being purple or the respiratory syncytial virus. It's true that we continue to have COVID along with these viruses, but, but it has actually been eclipsed by all of the influenza and respiratory syncytial virus circulation. And now I'm gonna break these out just so you can look at them compared to the prior year at Children's National. So this is our SARS-CoV-2 circulation. And if you look in red, this is our 2022-23 current season compared to last year. And again, look at the striking difference between this year um, and last year with, with SARS-CoV-2 infection, where last year we had the giant Omicron CoV-2 uh, surge, and we just did not have that kind of a surge with a nice flat line in red with constant low levels of circulation. Um, and in fact, at Children's National, we've now seen over 11,000 pediatric patients and admitted over 2,100 children. So for those of you who aren't as pediatric oriented, children can indeed get sick. About 3% of children uh, can be hospitalized and up to a quarter of those are critically ill as has been the case in our center. Let's pivot then to rhinovirus and enterovirus. It was very similar actually last year compared to this year. Um, but we did have higher levels of rhinovirus and enterovirus in red compared to 2021-22 in blue. And it did come in the fall when we usually expect it and has really come down to nice levels. But look at RSV, completely different story. So again, huge surge of RSV um, over the winter months and much higher than what we had uh, last year in blue. And lastly, influenza, same story. Giant, giant surge of influenza, very little last year at the same time. So in summary, during the initial two years of the COVID pandemic with stricter social distancing measures, we essentially had no other viruses co-circulating with SARS-CoV-2 virus. And since we've had a return to more normal social interactions and fewer mandates for masking, we've seen this large resurgence of multiple co-circulating viruses in addition to ongoing circulation of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we continue to monitor this. And in the last few weeks, um, we continue to see the total number of patients testing positive for these viruses continuing to decline. So we're very relieved that we're past the very large uh, winter trifecta, as we call it, with those three viruses that really surged. Uh, all of these viruses continue to decrease, although we're keeping a very close eye on RSV, as well as the newer variants of Omicron as they emerge. Now for physicians and clinicians that are seeing these patients, it's almost impossible to distinguish these uh, with a single patient in front of you. And as you can see in this very nice summary that was uh, prepared by the CDC and the graphic from CNN, um, if you compare the symptoms that patients have with RSV, COVID-19 and influenza, you see a lot of overlap of the red dots. All of them can have congestion, runny nose, cough, uh, they can also um, have sore throat, but some of the, the viruses are more likely to call we cause wheezing, and in particular, respiratory syncytial virus is much more likely to call cause wheezing than either COVID or flu in children. Um, and in fact, muscle or body aches or uh, loss of taste or smell are much more common to occur in COVID-19 than in RSV. Now, this is a nice graphic, but in reality, when the patient's in front of you, it's almost impossible to determine which they have without specific testing. And at our center, we do utilize testing, particularly in high-risk patients for which an, an intervention would be utilized if we could identify a particular virus. So these are specific considerations for healthcare providers from the Centers for Disease Control. We of course recommend and offer vac vaccinations against both influenza and SARS-CoV-2 virus for all eligible people. And that is now people that are six months of age or older. So almost all children are eligible and able to get these vaccines and we need to encourage this. We, uh, incur the CDC and we encourage diagnostic testing in the appropriate patients to guide treatment and clinical management. And we treat patients with suspected or confirmed influenza who meet clinical criteria uh, with influenza antivirals. And that still remains oral oseltamivir, five-day courses for all ages, as well as a new option of relatively new option of oral veloxivir, uh, which is called Zofluza as a single dose. The uh, oseltamivir is approved for all ages. 
uh, in outpatients with severe complicated or progressive illness, hospitalized influenza patients, and even those that have uncomplicated disease if it's very early in the illness. Uh, Baloxavir, on the other hand, is for patients who are over 12 years of age with high risk of developing flu or related complications or acute uncomplicated flu in otherwise healthy patients who are 5 to 12 years of age. We also have other choices such as inhaled zanamivir and IV paramivir, but these are used much less frequently. And then finally, we want to treat outpatients and hospitalized patients with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection who are identified in high-risk categories for progression to severe illness, but we are limited to Paxlovid, which is only in those over 12 years of age or over 40 kilograms. And, and the same is true for remdesivir. Uh, uh, so we will often bring these patients in for a three-day outpatient infusion if they are younger or smaller and cannot uh, get uh, uh, oral Paxlovid. So the crystal ball, you know, what is next? Are these viruses going to con continue to circulate and surge? Are, we, are they going to now come down to a low level and stay low for a while now that the population has been boosted? We really don't know the answer to that. We need to continue to be very vigilant and watch uh, both test positivity and hospitalizations for these viruses. As you all know, we, we also are not sure what's going to happen with the Omicron variants. We see in the news all the time uh, little reminders that there have been slight increases in hospitalizations and cases, but there are over 600 variants of Omicron, and none of the variants that have emerged so far are, are really uh, a different um, heritage from Omicron in general. So we haven't seen this progression from something as different as Delta or Alpha to Omicron. The current one that I'm sure you've been following in the news um, is the XBB.1.5. Uh, and this graphic from the Centers for Disease Control illustrates that as of January 21st of this year, this particular variant is now uh, up to 50% of all the variants in the United States and even higher in some parts of uh, the northeastern part of the United States. And this uh, bars on the right just show you the evolution of all the other variants that emerge and then decrease, such as BA.5, to almost negligence now whereas a new, a new variant may emerge at any time and then expand, uh, as we're seeing in the purple bar with XBB 1.5. So we'll have to continue to stay tuned and see what happens with both SARS-CoV-2 as well as these other viruses. So in summary, I'd like to acknowledge all of the Children's National Hospital teams for emerging infectious diseases response. This includes our special pathogens isolation unit and response teams, our infectious disease and infectious control divisions, and I'd like to particularly call out the infection control division that makes all of the, uh, does all the data surveillance and graphics for our weekly viral surveillance. We have other uh, very specialized task force for whatever um, emerging infectious diseases emerges. So we have congenital Zika program, acute flaccid myelitis, as well as MISC, which affects children. And I'll end there and we'll take questions during the panel. Thank you again. Hello again. Um, it's lovely to be here and thank you for that really superb uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Jabiasi. I really enjoyed it. Um, we are going to start the Q&A. We're slightly early and we are waiting also uh, for Dr. Karitskis, who I think is going to be here shortly. So I'm going to kick this off. Um, the first question was actually to me um, and the question was around MPOX being an STI. So I guess to reiterate what I said, there's arguments in both directions. So some people have said that because MPOX can be transmitted in other ways, it's not an STI in the traditional sense because it can also be transmitted as a result of contact with infected animals and in other ways. But during this outbreak, we've been able to isolate the virus in semen. And we've also found that uh, the lesions occur very close to the site of the sexual contact. So people who have vaginal sex um, with a contact uh, who has uh, penile lesions are likely to get vaginal disease. People who have anal sex are likely to get anal disease, oral sex, and, and, and you, you get the picture. So essentially, it does appear that sexual fluids are really important. 
Additionally, in our uh, paper when, where we described uh, women uh, and transgender uh, women, including cis, cis and transgender women and non-binary individuals assigned female at birth, what we found is that there was we were also able to isolate uh, mpox virus from uh, the vaginal fluids. So we have shown it's present in fluids, but you can find about 27 different viruses in fluids and that doesn't mean they're sexually transmitted. So this is a very long way of saying that it does look as though mpox uh, in this particular form that it is now uh, is the, sort of the 2A, 2B variant is actually behaving like a sexually transmitted infection in this particular form but it can also be transmitted in other ways and it's important that we don't forget that so that's a very long answer uh, but hopefully it covers your question there are some other questions on mpox but i am going to take a question which was actually for dr richardson and i'm going to take the question because i actually know the answer which is amazing because i don't know very much about ebola the question is, what is the incubation period of Ebola virus infection? And the answer is 21 days. So um, as that means that people can walk around and be uh, and spread the virus before they realize it, because you can be infectious before you develop symptoms. So the next question I'm going to direct uh, at Dr. Biasi and ask about the flu in terms of vaccination because we all know that vaccination is has become a very contentious issue with some people and with covid and this may have affected uptake of uh, influenza vaccination so we can see that there's been a big outbreak of influenza a as you've shown uh, very uh, clearly but in, in what is the relationship between vaccination and the outbreak? Is this because people haven't taken up the vaccine? Is the vaccine not working very well? That's one of the questions. Yeah, it's always hard to know. We know that vaccines do not prevent 100% of infections. I mean, they're not designed to do that. They're designed to attenuate the amount of virus that we have if we're infected so that we are spreading it less effectively and also to greatly diminish the likelihood that you will have severe infection or be hospitalized or die. And that's true uh, of SARS-CoV-2 virus, that's true of influenza virus, and really any virus for which we, you know, try to develop respiratory virus vaccines. So, you know, part of the reason why there was this large surge was for those reasons I explained for the other viruses, that there, there really just wasn't as much circulation at all. And then there was this longer period where people had absolutely no, um, you know, uh, exposure to these other viruses, so that when they did get exposed, it was just more marked as far as the amount of virus that they were excreting, spreading to others, leading to a very large surge of cases, and then, of course, a large surge of hospitalizations because of the, the lack of prior immunity and boosting. You know, now, should does that mean we shouldn't get vaccinated? And I, the way I try to explain this to people that are in our office, and particularly children, is you know we all drive cars every day and we know that if we uh, hit a car we could be in a severe accident we could die and we wear a seatbelt right because we know it's very unlikely that we're going to get in an accident but if we do we know that if that seatbelt's on it greatly diminishes the risk that we're going to fly out of the car and hit someone else and uh you know and ourselves be um uh, injured or have uh, a, a death so i really think people should and I, it is part of the public health role to explain to people more clearly what the role of the vaccine is. Because if we, you know, if we tell our patients in our community that the goal of vaccination is to stop all viral transmission, of course people don't get vaccinated because they see that doesn't happen. But that, of course, is not what's supposed to happen. We know that it doesn't stop all transmission. It, it does all the things that it's supposed to do. And from year to year, the efficacy with which that occurs varies. With influenza. So we could talk for hours about uh, influenza and universal flu vaccines and avian flu vaccines, but we'll maybe we'll get to that later in our session. Thanks. That's a really helpful answer. Uh, Dan, did you want to take over from here? Oops, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, uh, happy to do so. Um, uh, so uh, sorry for uh, being a couple of minutes late to the uh, to the discussion. Um, 
Um, there are a couple of questions to uh, Dr. Richardson, but unfortunately, as we explained, Dr. Richardson has uh, uh, come down with an upper respiratory infection and, <laughs> voice and is unable to, uh, to join us uh, for the Q&A today. So I'll uh, try my best to uh, uh, answer uh, in his uh, place. So uh, one is uh, what is the incubation period uh, of uh, Ebola virus and uh, why does it not spread fast like COVID-19? Uh, well, the incubation period, uh, I believe, is uh, uh, on the order of, uh, of five to 10 days. Um, but the reason it doesn't spread as fast is it's not an airborne uh, illness. It doesn't spread by, uh, through respiratory droplets or through aerosols. It really requires direct contact, uh, physical contact with an infected individual and their secretions. Uh, and so we're, um, it's really fortunate in many respects that Ebola is not as transmissible uh, as uh, respiratory viruses, or uh, we would be facing a, a, a situation analogous to the uh, plague uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, uh, and uh, so that uh, is an answer to, uh, to that. And then um, uh, the second question is whether uh, the vaccine that was uh, produced uh, in the DRC would also be uh, uh, active against strains in uh, in Sudan, um, and uh, I'm not uh, completely certain about that. There are um, there are some strain differences uh, with Ebola. Uh, they're um, not quite the differences that we have been seeing with the variants emerging with um, uh, with SARS-CoV-2, and not nearly as variable as uh, the challenges posed with an HIV vaccine. Uh, but um, uh, I, I'm not uh, completely uh, certain about uh, the answer uh, to that question. Um, some questions for uh, Professor Orkin. Um, uh, this question is uh, from uh, 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 Dr. Gideon in, uh, at the Riedemers University in Nigeria uh, and asking, is there any idea from your experience um, uh, patterns of monkeypox infection among pediatric populations. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dan, and thanks, Dr. Gideon, uh, and for your for your work anchoring uh, research in in Nigeria. Um, so, as you may know, I've been involved uh, actually working with some of your colleagues, um, sort of leading some large uh, collaborative uh, case series. And uh, we've looked at um, the initially large, large numbers of, of people who turned out to be men um, in, in, an, in about 16 different countries. And then we looked at women, transgender women and, and non-binary people, again, in lots of countries. And um, here we did not, we, we found that in the cis women, so women who were born at female at birth, what we found is that although there were children in the homes of a quarter of those women, there were only two children who actually got monkeypox, mpox. So from that, we can say that the transmissibility was actually very low. Um, we have tried to try and establish whether it would be worth trying to collaborate, to, to, to work together to come up with a large pediatric series, but the numbers have been so low that it's been very difficult to do this. But I am aware that there is an outbreak of, I think it's 2A virus in um, Sudan at the moment in refugee camps, and this is affecting children. So I think the answer to that is that there's not anything particularly joined up happening, uh, which is a problem. And it's quite difficult to study um, the pediatric populations uh, at the moment. Um, there's a related question uh, asking whether there is mother-to-child transmission of monkeypox. Yeah, so there, there has been a case written up. Um, yes, it, it, there's more than one case. It, it has been described both in the in, in what used to be known as the DRC strain, so, so the played one, uh, but also in this it's outbreak, it has actually been described. Um, and we do know that there are concerns around pregnancy in terms of um, the pregnancy outcomes, so children being infected, um, and also, you know, very severe disease uh, occurring, and also potentially um, premature uh, terminations of the pregnancy and wanted terminations of the pregnancy uh, due to adverse events during pregnancy. So, yeah, the outcomes are, it's not a good thing, 
uh, in terms of in terms of the women's health because women are relatively immunosuppressed um, and having very severe disease, but also in terms of of the outcome. So it is a worry. The CDC have just reported a a large case series of around seven hundred and sixty women. And they reported on 22 pregnancies, but unfortunately, they only could report on five outcomes. So they weren't able to really add to what is known. So there's still a data gap here, but in uh, in South America, they are starting to write up uh, pregnancies because they they have a much larger outbreak in women, and therefore we're more likely to get some some more granular data there. Yeah, my understanding is that there's a high rate of fetal loss in yeah. women who. Uh, yeah infected with monkeypox while pregnant and uh, at least uh, in a couple of case reports the um, uh, fetuses have been found to have monkeypox infection uh, as well as placenta uh, another I was, uh, I was just going to comment just, uh, just to piggyback off of that because you know children's hospital we see a lot of kids and we were uh, very <laughs> worried about what we would see in children uh, before it became clear that it was not as common but we did have several cases again as you mentioned where it was a, a part mother or partner who was infected and they were in a small enclosed environment in the apartment or whatever and then the, there was transmission through contact through children and we did treat those kids with um, the antiviral and they did very well and uh, the other point I was going to make is that um, in the prior outbreaks of monkeypox, it, the children actually had a very high um, morbidity and mortality. And that was part of the reason why in this particular outbreak, we were very aggressive about using antiviral, uh, but it seemed that this particular version of the monkeypox uh, did not seem to have that same amount of morbidity and mortality in, in the children who got it. And most of the cases we saw were in our adolescent population who acquired it um, through sexual encounters. So we, uh, unfortunately, you know, adolescents um, can get these same infections as adults. Um, question for you, uh, uh, Dr. Dibiazzi. Um, with your experience in vaccines for COVID-19, uh, would you recommend influenza vaccines in the TBI population? Actually, they are, at least in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Even before COVID, we, you know, we are uh, very much in favor of and suggest that you get your children, anyone over six months of age is eligible uh, for influenza vaccines. They're very well studied, they're very safe, they're efficacious, and there's really no reason not to give your child influenza vaccine. The other question we get asked a lot is, if you're giving COVID vaccine, should I delay the flu vaccine? And should I do both or not, or pick one? And no, you should get them both, and you can get them both at the same time. I myself got the one one arm and, and my booster in the other, and I had a, a little uh, race with my my mother who's 95, and we we kind of did a double blinded test about which one and which arm, and could we guess which was which? So you know you can have a little fun with this, but um, you really should get both. And sort of as a follow up, I think the other question that someone asked was, you know, why was there such a surge? If you remember from that curve, it came so much earlier this year and some people hadn't really gone to get their flu vaccine yet um, because sometimes people delay it until January or February, which you know you really shouldn't do. You should really get it in October when it comes out. Um, uh, and that may be another reason for the surge that we saw. And, and now you're going to be asked to pull out your crystal ball and uh, looking at yeah. the winter, <laughs> do you think we will return to a normal respiratory winter season? Yeah. Well, what is a normal respiratory season? I don't know anymore. Uh, you know, I, we get asked this a lot, and I always say I don't have a crystal ball. All I have is beautiful data surveillance from our infection control and uh, lab. Um, so, you know, when we start to see in our own hospital and, of course, the CDC and worldwide networks, when we see little blips of things, that's when we can, you know, use our crystal ball, but it's really not a crystal ball, it's it's surveillance. Um, and so I think we've appreciated during this last two years that investment in viral surveillance it, all across the globe is really critical. You can look all you want in, you know, the US, but you're gonna still be way behind the eight ball if we're not investing in surveillance all across the globe because things happen in one place and then uh, we can track as they move across the world. So. The, that's a long answer. The short answer is I don't know. We'll have to see. But I do feel like we've moved into a more um, regular approach to respiratory viruses right now where you use your common sense. If you're a high-risk individual, you do absolutely everything you can to protect yourself and you take it seriously. If you get infected, you seek treatment, which is available now for both SARS-CoV-2 um, and always has been for influenza. 
Um, but we don't necessarily want to tip the balance toward we're going to lock down society, do nothing, and uh, because there are other harms, particularly to our pediatric population that has suffered greatly uh, with just skyrocketing and historic levels of anxiety, mental illness, um, which is understandable based on what they've just been through. So um, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I hope that things settle out as they, I hope they stay settled out as they seem to be right now. It's interesting, based on the discussion two weeks ago at the, the FDA advisory committee meeting, they're, they're sort of banking on uh, COVID becoming more seasonal and uh, having uh, uh, annual vaccinations that coincide with the influenza vaccination. Uh, there was a fair bit of back and forth about whether that's a reasonable expectation or not, since we still don't really know. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't mention, but the the big uh, lurking, I guess, threat that we always worried about and really COVID kind of distracted us from is the avian influenza. And, you know, all of you who are buying your eggs and paying $8 a dozen, you know, that's a large part of that is because of a huge avian flu outbreak that's been going on that you don't see it as much in the news. Uh, but, you know, that still is a, a major lurking threat. If, the, if those avian flu strains ever develop the capability to move from human to human easily in the upper respiratory tract, that's going to be worse than COVID. Uh, you know, high mortality, and um, we're, we're still very worried about that. So there's been a lot of progress in developing um, non-cell-based or non-egg-based vaccines that could be ramped up quickly if that happened but not on a global level. I think, you know, the, the only approved uh, company right now could make, you know, I think 150 million doses in a few months, but that's not going to help on a global level. So we really have to be, uh, keep our eyes on those as well. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the next big issue will be whether uh, using some of the newer platforms, uh, particularly the uh, mRNA platform, but potentially others as well, uh, having, um, you know, um, um, multivalent vaccines, or uh, 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 not just multivalent, because that generally means many strains of the same virus, but but having combination vaccines where we're able to simultaneously immunize against several different respiratory viruses uh, yeah. is going to be uh, an interesting uh, thing to look for. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the mink infections in Spain are really concerning because the mink respiratory tract is very similar to the human respiratory tract. And the fact that large numbers of mink were infected with H5N1 uh, at the end of last year, resulting in a huge cull of mink, shows that it can establish in mammals. And they, they did think there was mink to mink transmission. And I do think that it's, it's, I agree. I mean, I think people are really quite concerned and we've already seen how difficult it is to go from having a vaccine you know, in stores to actually putting it in vials and in people's arms. And I think it is a worry. Um, I mean, I, I guess one of the other things that I've been wondering about now we've got, we've got experts on the line is how, given uh, the, that all of, sorry. I think maybe we should give up on this question, given that I've got a surge of dogs to the door. Can you, can you hear them? <laughs> oh no. Oh never mind. I'll carry on. Um so <laughs> I think one of the one of the difficulties is is how useful neutralization assays are in understanding with the new Omicron strands, how helpful um you know the vaccines are in, in, against the newer strains as they emerge. Because as you've said, almost all of the viruses we're seeing worldwide, even the viruses in China, are d derivatives of Omicron. Um, and we are now in a situation where the derivation appears to be, you know, sort of Omicron onwards. Uh, and because of the high degrees of uh, mucosal immunity, the high degrees of, you know, immunity in general, uh, vaccination in the population now, um, what we're not seeing is the degree of severity and deaths uh, with the newest variants, despite the fact that the neutralization is, is, is not good. So how do we move forward in understanding um, which new new strains are going to be really of concern given all the diversity? Well, I think there are two different parts to that question. One is how do we know which strains we want to be vaccinating against? And uh, for COVID, we, or SARS-CoV-2, we really don't know because we 
we can't predict what strains will emerge and we don't have the well-established uh, patterns of between southern and northern hemisphere that have been so helpful in choosing uh, influenza vaccines uh, year to year. Um, the, the more important part of the question is uh, how do we incorporate into our uh, tracking of immune responses to the vaccines and their uh, assessing their efficacy um, measures beyond neutralizing antibody, in particular cell-mediated immunity. Uh, and uh, I think the big challenge there is those, those assays uh, can be done. Uh, the problem is to do them on a large scale is uh, both time-consuming and expensive, but also requires much more upfront um, uh, management in terms of processing of the blood uh, because you need the cells, uh, have, the blood has to be handled differently. It's not, not quite as simple as, as drawing off uh, serum or plasma, freezing it, and being able to go back to, uh, to it at some point whenever it's convenient to, uh, to do uh, large-scale testing. So, but it, I, I think there's no question that there's been immunity conferred beyond simply humoral immunity, uh, and that part of the reason why boosting uh, with a bivalent booster that no longer matches the circulating strains uh, is demonstrating some protection against severe disease. Uh, is because uh, these other responses are being stimulated uh, in addition to the stimulation that's happening from natural infection. Uh, and um, the more we understand that, the better we'll be able to uh, uh, design and, uh, and, and uh, uh, implement uh, more universal vaccines that may be able to target conserved epitopes, not just humoral epitopes, but epitopes that elicit cellular immunity uh, as well as epitopes beyond the uh, spike protein, which may uh, provide uh, broader protection uh, as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Dr. DiBiase wants to. No, I was going to say the same thing about um, cellular immunity. There's so much more to be learned on that. And that's a that part of the immune uh, response is a large piece of many studies that are you know ongoing right now. So I think it's pretty clear that it's not just humoral immuni immunity that's important, and that's not surprising, you know, based on what we know about other uh, vaccines and uh, viral infections. Uh, but I, we don't know yet. We have a question about uh, how well are we doing this year in uh, matching uh, the uh, vaccine strains to what's uh, the influenza viruses that are circulating? It's a good match uh, based on, you know, it was an early, usually there. We're starting to just, you know, get the big surge now, and then the, the stuff is being evaluated after, but it is a good match this year. The overall efficacy, we won't know yet, but usually in, in a good year with a good match and other factors, it's 40 to 60 percent efficacious, and but it can be as low as 10 percent, you know, efficacious in other years. Um, but again, it's the same thing I talk about with the seatbelt, you know. If you have a 10 percent chance that you won't get killed in the car wreck, you're still going to wear your seatbelt, right? So. Um, uh, it, it really makes sense to get the vaccine. And I think another thing is some people uh, will say, oh, it already came and went early this year. So I'm I'm skipping it this year. It's already done. But we know uh, historically that we always have two big surges. One is usually influenza A, and then later we get influenza B. So you're not out of the woods yet. You should definitely um, tell your patients and your family and yourself to get your vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Professor Orkin, um, what about post-exposure prophylaxis uh, against monkeypox in uh, MSM persons? And I would take this to mean both uh, uh, immune prophylaxis and pharmaceutical or uh, pharmacological yeah. prophylaxis. So there's two things that you can do. You can give a vaccine. Um, you can give the smallpox vaccine. You can give Invenex, Genios, um, or ACAM to people who don't have, who aren't living with HIV. You can give that within four days of infection to limit the, the mitigate the severity of the disease and, and limit the severity of the disease. They say up to 14 days, but really four days is probably pushing it. You can also give IVIG, uh, and this has been given. Um, this has certainly been used in the US, I know, and also in the UK uh, in very severe, severe uh, in infections uh, as an option. Uh, sometimes, you know, in preference or before or in addition to, to, to antivirals. So that is certainly something that can be uh, considered if you have it available. And uh, uh, T-pox for PEP? Uh, yeah, I, I think this is something which, which um, 
needs to be evaluated as as, as potential prep. Um, but in terms of PEP, you, can, you know, antivirals are are potentially effective. There's a very large CDC data set showing that they they can't say based on all of the confounders, but they can certainly say that that te that it's looking uh, safe. Uh, and they are also saying that they think it's shortening duration of, of, of infection, this particular antiviral tecovirumab. So, yeah, whether it can be used in other ways, um, you know, like like maybe we could add it to doxyprep, um, doxyprep pox. <laughs> we need to tell Jean-Michel. Uh, I'm sure he, if anyone's going to do that study, it's going to be him. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I don't see that we have uh, other questions. Um, so th this has really been a terrific discussion as always. Uh, so much to uh, uh, to talk about uh, with these uh, emerging and uh, re-emerging viral infections. Um, and, and fortunately we have better and better tools to uh, manage them. But we, I think as came out in the questions and in the presentations, it obviously still much progress to be made on, on all fronts. Uh, so let me uh, uh, thank uh, in absentia, uh, Dr. Uh, Richardson for his uh, presentation. And then of course, uh, uh, Professor Orkin and Dr. DiBiazzi uh, for your uh, presentations. Um, and um, uh, we'll uh, close out the program. If you can bring up the closing slides here, but please uh, remember to participate in the post-meeting survey. And uh, now that we've come to the end of the event, uh, uh, this is enormously helpful to us in uh, helping to improve our programs and make sure that our programs are meeting uh, your needs. A certificate of attendance will be sent by email upon completion of the post-workshop survey. A recording of the full program will be available within three weeks of today uh, on this uh, virtual platform. Uh, after three weeks uh, provided uh, permission from the speakers, the material will also become available on the Academic Medical Education website. I'd like to acknowledge our endorsers, uh, which include uh, IAPAC and uh, NATAP, and uh, uh, acknowledge my uh, co-program director, uh, Jonathan Shapiro from the National Hemophilia Center uh, at Sheba Medical Center in Israel, and I'm uh, uh, Daniel Karitskis from Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School uh, in the United States. So thank you once again for joining. Uh, for those of you who will be attending CROI, I uh, look forward to uh, seeing you uh, in a week's time. And uh, the rest, remember that in the first week of March, we will be having the next of our um, clinical COVID-19 uh, workshops and hope to see you then.